Welcome to Talking Art Encyclopedia. Subscribe now and let's start the conversation. Carl Gustav Jung was 84 years old when he was interviewed for the BBC series Face to Face in October 1959. At the time, he was the world's greatest living psychologist, founder of analytical psychology and originator of the concept of a collective unconscious. So his agreeing to be interviewed was an historic coup. Indeed, he was arguably John Freeman's most famous guest ever to appear in the series. The programme itself didn't follow the usual studio format. A film team flew to young Zurich home. And as well as seeing the old man walking by the lakeside, viewers were also given a glimpse of the usually shadowy, somewhat enigmatic John Freeman himself, whose face, despite the programme's title, rarely appeared on the screen. And another difference, of all the 35 face-to-face -face guests, Jung was the only one to refuse to have his portrait drawn by Felix Topolsky for the programme's opening sequence. wonder what an analyst would make of that. At the time of the interview, Jung was still working. His mind was still sharp, his concentration focused. It was a timely interview. Eighteen months later, Jung was dead. But Freeman's shrewdly balanced questions about the life and about the work create a rounded portrait of one of the greatest men of his day. Of them all, this face-to-face -face is a part of history. Switzerland. Carl Gustav Jung. Born in 1875. With Freud, one of the founding fathers of modern psychology. Still working at 84, he is the most honored living psychiatrist and history will record him as one of the greatest physicians of all time. Professor Jung, how many years have you lived in this lovely house by the lake at Zurich? It's just about 50 years. Um, do you live here now just with your secretaries and your English housekeeper? Yes. Yeah. No children or grandchildren with you? Oh, no, they don't live here. But I have plenty of them with the surroundings. Do they come to see you often? Well, oh, yes. How many grandchildren have you? Oh, 19. And great-grandchildren? Oh, eight. I think eight. And uh, I suppose one is on the way. And do they, uh, do you enjoy having them? Well, of course it's nice to, to feel such a living crowd out of oneself. Are they afraid of you, do you think? I don't, I don't think so. If you would know my grandchildren, they wouldn't think so. <laughs> yeah. What? They steal my things. Uh, even my hat trap belongs to me. They stole the other day. <laughs> now, can I take you back to your own childhood? Do you remember the occasion when you first felt consciousness of your own individual self? That was in my 11th year. There I suddenly, on my way to school, I stepped out of the mist. It was just as if I had been in a mist, walking in a mist, and I stepped out of it and I knew I am. I am what I am. And then I thought, but what ha have I been before? And then I found that I was, that I had been in a mist. Not knowing to differentiate myself from things. I was just one thing about among, among many things. Now, was that associated with any particular episode in your life, or was it just a normal function of adolescence? Well, um, that's difficult to say. Uh, as far as I can remember, nothing had happened before that would explain this sudden coming to consciousness. You hadn't, for instance, been quarrelling with your parents or anything? No, no, no. Uh, what memories have you of, of your parents? Were they strict and old-fashioned in the way they brought you up? Oh, well, you know, they belonged uh, to the later parts of the Middle Ages. And uh, my father was passing in the country and, uh, and uh, you can imagine uh, the what people were then, you know, in the 70s of the past century, they had the convictions. 
in which uh, people have lived since uh, 1,800 years. How did he try to impress these convictions on you? Did he punish you for all the wonderful for all the but very liberal life, and he was most scholarly, but most understanding. What sort of religious upbringing did your father keep? Oh, we were Swiss reformed. And did he make you attend church regularly? Oh, well, that was quite natural. Everybody went to to to, to church after yes. Sunday. And did you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you now believe in God? Uh, now? Difficult to answer. I know. I need to, I don't need to believe. I know. What about your school days now? Were you happy at school? As a school pain? I, at the beginning, I was very happy to have a, a companions, you know, because before I had been very lonely. We lived in the country and um, uh, I had no, no, no brother and no sister. My sister was born very much later when it was 90 years old. And so I was used to be alone, but I missed it. I missed company. And in school, it was wonderful to have company. But soon, um, you know, in a country school, naturally, I, I, I was far ahead. And, and then I began to be bored. And uh, I had a difficulty with certain teachers uh, that didn't believe that I could write a decent thesis. I remember one case where the teacher had the person to the habit to uh, discuss the papers written by the, the, the pupils. And he took the best first. And he went through the whole uh, number of uh, the pupils and uh, I didn't appear. And uh, I was... Uh, I had to travel to the it, and I thought, well, it is possible that my thesis can be that bad. And uh, when he had finished, he said, there is still one paper left over, and that is the one by Jung. That would be by far the best paper if it hadn't been copied. He has, he has just copied it somewhere, stolen. You are a thief, Jung. And if I knew where you had uh, have stolen it, you, uh, you, I would fling you out of school, and I, I was mad, and I uh, said, uh, "This is uh, the, the one thesis where I have worked the most, because the, the theme was interesting. It got that distinction, you know, to all the themes of job, not at all interesting to me." And, uh, and then he said, "You are a liar, and if you can prove that you have stolen that thing so well, uh, then you get out of school." Now, that was a very serious thing to me, because what else then, you see? And I hated that fellow, and that was the, the only man I could have killed, you know. If I had met him once at the dark corner, I would have shown him something of what I could do. Did you often have violent thoughts about people when you were young? No, not exactly. Only when they got mad. Well, then I beat them up. And did you often get mad? Not so often, but then for good. And you were you were very strong and big, I am. Yes, I was pretty strong. And you know, the reared in the country with those peasant boys was a rough kind of life. And I, I, I would, would have been capable of for, 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 for violence, I know. I was a bit afraid of it. So I... I rather try to avoid the critical situations because I didn't trust myself once I was attacked by uh, about uh, seven boys and I got mad and I took one and just swung him round with his legs, you know and, and, and beat down four of them and then they, they were satisfied and were there any uh, consequences from that? Oh, I should say, yes uh, from then on I was always, always suspected that I was at the bottom of every trouble. I was not, but uh, they were afraid, and I was never attacked again. Well, now, when the time came that you qualified as a doctor, what made you decide to specialize in being an alienist? 
Ja, das ist rather an interesting point. When I, I had finished my studies practically, and when I um, uh, didn't know what I really wanted to do, I had a big chance in, in, for, uh, to follow one of my professors. He, uh, he was called to a new position in Munich, and he wanted me as his assistant. And and th but then in that moment I uh, studied for my final examination. Um, I came across the textbook, a textbook of uh, psychiatry. Up to then, I thought nothing about it because our professor then wasn't particularly interesting. And I read, I only read the introduction to that book where certain things were said uh, about uh, diagnosis as a maladjustment of the personality. That hit the nail on the head. In that moment, I saw I must become an alienist. My heart was thumping wildly in that moment. Uh, and uh, when I told my professor I, I wouldn't follow him, I would study uh, psychiatry, he couldn't understand it. No, my my friends, uh, because in those days, psychiatry was, was nothing, nothing at all. But I saw one the one great chance to unite a certain uh, the, uh, contrasting things in myself, namely, Beside medicine, beside natural science, I always had studied uh, history of philosophy and, and such subjects. Uh, it was just as if suddenly two streams were joining. And how long was it after you took that decision that you first came in contact with Freud? Oh, you know, that was at the end of my studies and, and then it took quite a while until I met Freud. Will you tell me how that happened? Did you go? To... Oh, well, I'd written a book about the psychology of the uh, dementia of precocious, so called schizophrenia then. Uh, and uh, I sent him that book and thus became acquainted. I went, I went to Vienna for a fortnight then, and then we had a very uh, uh, long and penetrating conversations. And uh, that settled it. And this long and penetrating conversation was followed by a personal friendship. Oh yes, it soon developed into a personal friendship. And what sort of man was Freud? Well, he was a complicated nature, you know. I liked him very much, and but I soon discovered that when he had thought something, then it was settled. While well, I was doubting all along the line. And... Uh, it was impossible to discuss something really a fool. You know, he had no philosophical education, particularly, you see, I was studying Kant, and uh, I was steeped in it, and, uh, and that was far from Freud. So, uh, from the very beginning, there was a discrepancy. Tell me, did Freud himself ever analyze you? But, yeah, oh yes, I had uh, submitted quite a lot of my dreams to him. And so did he. And he to you, yes. Oh yes, yes. yes. Um, do you remember now, at this distance of time, what were the significant features of Freud's dreams that you noted at the time? Well, that is rather indiscreet to ask, you know, I have never such a thing as a professional secret. He's been dead these uh, many years. Uh, I... Yeah, yes, but uh, his uh, regards last longer than life. I prefer not to talk about it. Well, may I ask you something else, though, which perhaps is also in speak? Is it true that you have a very large number of letters which you exchanged with Freud, which are still unpublished? Yes. When are they going to be published? Well, uh... Not during my lifetime. You would have no objection to them being published after your life? Oh, no, not at all. Because they are probably of great historical importance. I don't think so. 
then it, wh why have you not published them so far? Because it, they were not important to me I, I, enough. I see no particular importance to them. Uh, they are concerned with personal matters. Well, partially. Uh, but I wouldn't have to, to, to publish them. Well, now, can we move on to the time when you did eventually uh, part company with Freud? Uh, it was partly, I think, with the publication of your book, The Psychology of the Unconscious, is that correct? That is, that is what was the real cause. Well, now, before you, well, I mean the, the, the final cause, because it had a long preparation. You know, from the beginning, I had a reservoir of mentalis. I couldn't uh, agree with uh, quite a number of his uh, ideas. Which ones in particular? Well, uh, chiefly in his purely personal approach and his disregard of uh, the historical conditions of man. You see, we depend largely upon our history. The we are shaped through education, through the influence of the parents, which are by no means always personal. They were prejudiced or they were influenced by historical ideas or what I call dominance. And, uh, and that is uh, a most decisive factor in psychology. And we are not of today or of yesterday. We are of an immense age. Was it not partly your observation, your clinical observation, of psychotic cases which led you to differ from Freud on this? It was partially my experience with, with uh, schizophrenic patients that uh, led me uh, to the idea of certain general historical conditions. Is there any one case that you can now look back on and feel that perhaps it was the turning point of your thought? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm, I made quite a number of experiences of that sort, and I went uh, even to Washington to uh, study the uh, Negroes at the psychiatric clinic there in order to find out whether they have the same type of dreams as we have. Uh, and uh, these experiences and others led me then to the hypothesis that there is an impersonal stratum in our psyche. Now, tell me, how did you st first decide to start your work on the psychological types? Was that also as a result of some particular clinical experience? Uh, less so. It was a very personal thing. Namely, to do justice to the psychology of Freud, also to that of Adler, and to find my own bearings. Uh, that helped me to understand why Freud developed such a theory. Or why Arthur developed his theory, his power principle. Had you concluded what psychological type you are yourself? Naturally, I had devoted a great deal of attention to that <laughs> painful question, you know. And reached a conclusion. Well, you see, the, the type is nothing static. It it changes with the, in the course of life. Uh, uh, but I will certainly... Uh, was characterized by Silky. I always thought, from the only child who died. And uh, I had a great deal of intuition too. And I had a definite difficulty with feeling. Uh, and uh, my relation to reality was not particularly brilliant. I was often at variance with the reality of things. Now that gives you all the necessary data for, 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 for the, the, the diagnosis. During the 1930s, when you were working a lot with the German patients, you did, I believe, forecast that a, a, a second world war was very likely. Well, now, looking at the world today, do you feel that a third world war is likely? I have no definite indications in that respect. But there are so many indications that one doesn't know what one sees. Is it trees or is it the wood? It's very difficult to say. 
uh, because the the dreams of uh, people's dreams contain apprehensions, you know. But it is very difficult to say uh, whether they point to a war, because that idea is uppermost in people's mind. Probably, you know, it has been much simpler. People didn't think of a war. And therefore, it was rather clear what the dreams meant. Nowadays, no more so. We are so full of apprehensions, fears, but that one doesn't know exactly to what it points. One thing is sure, a great change of our psychological attitude is imminent. That is so. Well, because we need more. We need more psychology. We need more understanding of human nature because the only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger. And we are pitifully unaware of it. We know nothing of man. Far too little. His psyche should be studied because we are the origin of all coming evil. And you, you have written one time in other some sentences which have surprised me a little about death. Now, in particular, I, I remember you said that death is psychologically just as important as birth. And like it, it's an integral part of life. But surely it can't be like birth if it's an end, can it? Yes, if it's an end. And there we are not quite certain uh, about this end. Because, you know, there are these uh, peculiar faculties of the psyche that it isn't entirely confined to, to space and time. You can have uh, dreams or visions of the future. You can see uh, round corals and such things. Only ignorance deny these, these facts. They are, it's quite evident that they do exist and have existed always. Now, these facts be, show that the psyche, in part at least, is not dependent upon these confinements. And then what? When the psyche is not under that obligation to live in time and space alone, and obviously it doesn't, then in, uh, to that extent, the psyche is not superior to those laws. And uh, that means uh, a, a practical uh, um, in, uh, continuation of life, of a sort of psychical existence uh, beyond time and space. Self believe that death is probably the end, or do you, do you? Well, I I can't say. You see, the word belief is a, diff a difficult thing for me. I don't believe. I must have a reason. Uh, for, for a certain hypothesis, either I know a thing, and when I know it, I don't be, need to believe it. If I, I don't allow myself, for instance, to be, believe a thing just for the sake of believing it, uh, I, I can't believe it. But when there are sufficient reasons to, for a certain hypothesis, I shall accept these reasons, naturally. I should say, we have to reckon with the possibility of so-and-so, uh, you -so. know. Well, now, you told us that we should regard death as being a goal. Yes. And that to shrink away from it is to evade life. For yes. Purposes. Yes. What advice would you give to people in their later life to enable them to do this, when most of them must in fact believe that death is the end of everything? Well, you see, it is if you I have treated many old people. And it's quite interesting to, to watch what the oncologist is doing with the fact that it is apparently threatened with a complete end, uh, it disregards it. It Life behaves as if it were going on. And uh, so I think it is better for all people to live on, to, to look forward to the next day, uh, as if he had to spend centuries and then he lives properly. But when he is afraid, when he doesn't look forward, he looks back, he petrifies, he, he, 
he gets uh, stiff and, and he dies before his time. But when he is living on, looking forward to the great adventure that is ahead, then he lives. And that is about what the Algosha is intending to do. Of course, it's quite obvious that we are all going to, to die, and this is uh, the, the, the sad fi finale of everything. Um, but uh, nevertheless, there is something in us that doesn't believe it, apparently. But it, this is merely a fact, a psychological fact. For, doesn't mean to me that it proves something. It is simply so. For instance, I may not know why we need salt, but we prefer to eat salt too, because you feel better. And so when you think in a certain way, you may feel considerably better. And I think if you think along the lines of nature, then you think properly. And this leads me to the last question that I want to ask you. As the world becomes more technically efficient, it seems increasingly necessary for people to behave communally and collectively. Now, do you think it's possible that the highest development of man may be to submerge his own individuality in a kind of collective consciousness? That's hardly possible. I think there will be a, a reaction. The reaction will set in against this uh, communal dissociation. You know, man doesn't stand forever in his nullification. Once there will be uh, a reaction, and uh, I, see it, I see it setting in, you know, uh, when I think of my patients, they all seek their own existence and to assure their existence against that complete atomization into nothingness or into meaninglessness. Man cannot stand a meaningless life. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more.